let's, uh, let's talk a moment about installing Asterisk, OK? So we'll kind of build it from the ground up. And essentially, we've got three ways, really, that are, are common to installing Asterisk. So we can install from the aster actual source code. And like I mentioned, you can download the source code at asterisk.org slash downloads. That's, uh, that's free to download. Um, I'll mention this. I'll, I'll just go on a tangent for a moment about open source software. So uh, what, is it, what does it mean for open source software to be free? Okay? We, we hear this a lot. Open source software is free. But what does that mean? Well, if you guys are familiar with Richard Stallman, uh, you know, a, an, an open source proponent, he talks about a free, free as in freedom, not as in beer. Right? So if I have free beer, that means I show up and it means free as in terms of no cost, as, as, a, as a gratis, right? So free as in gratis is in terms of no cost. And uh, sometimes you can download something for no cost. So for example, you can go to asterisk.org slash downloads, uh, and you can download the source code gratis for no cost, right? But that doesn't mean that oh, you can't charge any money for it. So uh, like I said, you know, we at uh, Digium uh, have or actually, well, Switchfox built it, our uh, compatriots in uh, San Diego, and then we acquired them. But uh, you know, the Switchfox guys, they took the Asterisk open source engine, they built Switchfox on top of that, and now we sell that PBX. And you can do the same thing. You can take the Asterisk engine that you downloaded for free, you can build your PBX on it, and you can sell that PBX for money. So just because it's open source doesn't mean you have to give it away for free. That's kind of the difference. So we say you know, free is in, in freedom. And what does that mean? Well, it means you're free to look at the source code. You can see exactly what it does. Uh, you're free to modify the source code. You can go in there and, and hack around with it and, and make it do things that it doesn't do normally, just for your particular instance. Uh, in that case, what you, you, know, you got to do is, um, if you're hacking with the actual C code, then we say, please contribute that back to the community. Um, you, know, you got it for free. In some cases, you're, you're, you're obligated to do so under the, G, the GPL license. And so, um, I'll, I'll just make a, a quick note here about the, the licensing of Asterisk. Asterisk is dual licensed, OK? So it's licensed under the GPL version 2. And if you guys are familiar with open source licensing, there's about a bajillion kinds of open source licensing. So you've got like Apache license, and you've got GPL license, and you've got all these different kinds of licenses. I think Mozilla has their own license too. And uh, Asterisk is licensed under a very common one, GPL. It's GPL version 2. And so if you, if you want to know more about what you can and cannot do with, with the source code of Asterisk, you can look at the GPL version 2. And uh, the GPL version 2 is, is designed to um, you know, allow you to get the source code as freely as possible, allow you to do what you need to do with it as freely as possible. And um, if you make changes to source code, to, to contribute it back in to the, uh, to the community. But you can look at GPL version 2. The other way that the Asterisk source code is uh, distributed is via OEM. So we do have an OEM license. And so uh, some of you may have made phone calls on Asterisk, and you didn't even know it was running Asterisk. So for, uh, for some typically large businesses that have a need to license Asterisk in a way that they can actually make changes to the source code and then close source those changes and make them proprietary, there is actually an OEM license as well. So you can actually uh, purchase the OEM license. So there's a GPL license and there's an OEM license. Both of them are available. So this relates to the source code. You can uh, download the source and compile from source. And so if you're familiar with Linux, this is, a, this is a pretty typical way to install Linux software. So you know in the Windows world, you have a .exe. You click the .exe and it installs. In the, in the Linux world, we compile the software. So you actually get the actual source code, and then you run it through a compiler. And in this case, uh, you know, we use GCC typically to compile a source. Um, and that's one way to do it. Another way is via repository. And so uh, you know, a repo is another concept within Linux where you can have a software repository. And you typically have what's called like a package manager. Okay? So I'll show some example of that. And you can actually have a distribution. So, uh, many of us are probably already familiar with distributions. Do we have anybody who uh, currently has used or is using uh, Asterisk now as a distribution? Okay, several in the room. How about um, Elastics? We have uh, people using Elastics, uh, PBX and a Flash. Several guys. Uh, any other distros that you guys are using? Free PBX. A free PBX distro, okay. 
Cool. So there are there are lots of uh, lots of distributions. Uh, Tricksbox too. I think um, I don't know if they still call it Tricksbox. Okay. Uh, so um, there's lots of, of actual distributions that you can you can uh, download the full-on distribution. So we'll look at that. When you download the source code, like I said, you can go to uh, asterisk.org/downloads. And in fact, my uh, my page is a little outdated here. Um, we actually just updated our asterisk.org. So we have a brand new asterisk.org page, which is uh, pretty cool. Our, our web team, really the, the goal in updating the new asterisk.org page is to get people to the information faster. So we really wanted to cut a lot of the clutter, make a really simple interface, and get you to the information quickly. So you can see right at the top here, you can go to downloads. And if we go to downloads, we can see there's a nice big just download asterisk link, okay? So when you download asterisk, in this case, that link is going to be linked to like the most popular version that we have at that time. In this case, I think currently it's serving a 1.8 certified asterisk. Uh, probably when 11 launches, maybe we'll change that to, uh, to asterisk 11. And if you want to see the all the asterisk versions, you can actually go here and uh, you know download you know asterisk 10, asterisk 10 Digium phones, asterisk 8 LTS. Um, you know these these specific. Uh, versions you can get here on the version page. So from asterisk.org slash downloads, you can download the source code. Now, the cool thing about building from source, and I, I alluded to this earlier in the talk, is that uh, it's going to give you a tool called menu select. Okay. Now, the menu select tool is when you are compiling from source, you would run in the source directory, make menu select, and you're going to get this handy tool. Let's uh, you know, risk a live demo. And see if I can actually pop it up. So tip a pretty typical place to store your source code is in user source. And I have a certified asterisk that I'm running here. Let's do make menu select and see if it will actually uh, pop up for me. It won't because my terminal is too small. Let's see if this will do it. Hey, there we go. Okay, This is what the, the menu select tool looks like. And so this, this is really cool because it, it gives you a lot of information if you're com actually compiling from source. So you've downloaded the source code. Uh, you would run some commands to, to, to compile it. So we typically run dot slash configure. Then we're going to run make, make install. There's uh, some dependencies to resolve. If you go to, actually, before I even show my menu select, I'll, I'll show you guys a, a place you can, you can go to get some help. Wiki.asterisk.org. Okay? So wiki.asterisk.org, this is the official asterisk wiki. Uh, there's a lot of information about asterisk on the internet. A lot of it is outdated um, and is, you know, varying degrees of helpfulness. This is the official asterisk wiki, and uh, of course, where else are you going to be able to go and see posts by Rusty Newton? You know, I mean, Rusty is the, uh, you know, the open source uh, community manager for asterisk. Uh, Malcolm, he's our product manager for asterisk, and they're putting stuff here on the wiki all the time. And if you look at the asterisk project. This wiki, many parts of it are auto-updated from the source code. So literally, if the, if the source code documentation within the code changes, it gets ported out to the wiki so that you've got some really up-to-date information. And what's nice is if you look over on the side here, you've got a, a getting started link. And this, uh, this getting started pages here will walk you through compiling asterisk from source. So I won't go through the exact steps. They are on the wiki. What I do want to show you is the menu select tool. So within menu select, uh, these are my uh, modules that I was talking about earlier. So for example, app CDR is going to give me call detail records. If I uh, disable it, then I'm not going to build that module. So maybe I don't need the CDR records. Maybe I'm using CEL, which is channel event logging, and I don't want to use CDRs at all. I don't even need to build that module, right? Uh, so I can say which ones I want to build. but uh, what's cool, let me see. Okay, so app flash, right? So 
if I want to build App Flash, if I want to know what App Flash is or what it does, I can get on the wiki and I can look at you know, what App Flash is going on. But you'll notice that it's, it's X'd out. It's got the three X's. It's basically saying, hey, if you want to build App Flash, you're not going to be able to build it. Well, why? Well, because it, it depends on Dottie. Okay? So if uh, that's a Dottie is a, is a prerequisite. So essentially, with my box here, I haven't compiled Dottie. It's a, you know, it's a little VM I'm running on my box, and I just use it for VoIP. I don't have any hardware cards in my laptop. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't build Dottie. But I basically can't build that module until I have Dottie. Uh, this will also tell you, let me see if I can find uh, some other stuff. So for example, let's say I want CDR ODBC, right? ODBC is an open database connector. This is a, you know, res, res ODBC is a module that's going to allow me to do, uh, it's an abstraction layer that allows me to connect, you know, to any kind of relational database I want, basically. So if I have a Postgres database or if I have a MySQL database, I can have an ODBC abstraction layer that is going to, it's going to talk between the database and asterisk to allow me to make those kind of communications. And I can put all kinds of stuff in my database. I can put, uh, instead of configuration, can, configuring asterisk in my .conf text-based files, I can configure asterisk in the database. Now it's uh, dynamic and scalable, right? I can send my call records. In this case, that's what's going on here with CDR ODBC. My actual call detail records, instead of uh, saving them to disk, I can, uh, I can write them to a database through uh, uh, res CDR ODBC, right? And so, or through CDR ODBC module. And you can see, uh, in order for me to build this module, it depends on the res ODBC module, right? Um, I'm trying to think of channel drivers. Uh, these ones here, like Chan GTalk and Chan Jingle. So, in this case, what I can see here is it depends Chan GTalk, and uh, like I said, this is this is in the 1.8. Um, I think in the in the 10 and 11, we've got Chan Motif. But anyway, you can see here. It depends on a uh, res jabber, and so jabber, it's the, it's the resource module. So I need to build that resource module before I can build Chan GTalk. But I also need the, the uh, Ikismil and open SSL dependencies, right? So using my package manager, I want to, I want to resolve those dependencies. So menu select is a, is a pretty cool tool. If you're familiar with Linux system administration, if you're, if you're compiling from source, you can use the menu select tool not only to select which modules you want, but it will tell you what your dependencies are. That is pretty cool. So um, hop out of that. And then, of course, when you, uh, you know, set those flags, it sets, the, uh, it sets what you want to compile in the menu select tool. So when I install from source, I'm going to download. Uh, when I download from asterisk.org, it's going to be a tarball, okay? And uh, a tarball, if you're familiar with Linux, is kind of, or if you're familiar with Windows, it's kind of like a Windows zip file. A tarball is a compressed uh, file, and so you're going to download that software in a tarball, and you're going to uncompress it. In this case, we're going to run the tar command on Linux, and like I said, all of those instructions are on the wiki. Uh, we talk about them in our online training, Asterisk Essentials uh, online training. Um, if you guys have questions about compiling from source, uh, maybe we, when they're in the question and answer time, we'll, we'll talk more about that. The other way to get the source code is through subversion. Uh, so do we have anyone here who's, uh, who's used a subversion or um, maybe Git, uh, a couple of guys in here? So if you guys have used some kind of a software management tool, Asterisk is run on subversion. And you can actually use a S SVN, which is the uh, you know, subversion within Linux SVN command, to check out. You can do an SVN checkout. And you can actually check out the source code, which is um, really nice if you're if you're like a if you're a developer. So if we have any developers in the room, and you're like, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily build a PBX out of asterisk, or maybe you are, but you want to do some actual asterisk contributing and coding. Developers typically check out from uh, SVN because then you can actually check out the trunk code, which is you know what's getting modified every day. Check that out from SVN, and there's instructions on that on uh, asterisk.org. So when you get on to asterisk.org, there is uh, instructions here to how, to how to get the code from SVN. Also talked about repositories, okay? So uh, earlier when I was talking about resolving dependencies, this is what we do in Linux. Uh, it's, it's actually awesome. I, man, I love this. <laughs> 
you know, I came from like a Windows IT background, but once I started to get into Linux, I was like, this is the best. Uh, when you have a package manager, what it is, is, is it's, you know, someone who's been really nice, or maybe at some point somebody who's uh, been paid some money, to take that software and, and package it in a sense so that it's easy to install and easy to update. And so you'll have a tool. So for example, if you're running like Debian or Ubuntu, you would have the apt tool. And so you would do, you know, apt get. And you can even apt get asterisk and, uh, and, and download asterisk from the repository. This is how you resolve dependencies. So I, was talk I showed earlier, hey, I needed my open SSL. And um, I think I do have it installed, but it was just showing me that that was a, a dependency. The way I would do that on a CentOS system is I would do yum install uh, open SSL, or I could do a yum search to find out what packages were available. And from that package manager, I can, I can download actual the actual asterisk software. Now, there's some, uh, there's some bonuses to this. One of the bonuses is that the dependencies are automatically resolved for you. So when you compile from source, uh, you may get some compilation errors. So for example, you may uh, be running through and it may tell you, you need uh, libxml2, and um, you don't have that dependency. And so you, here you've been compiling for two minutes and it failed on you. So now you have to go and install that dependency before you can finish your, your compilation. And it's kind of up to you, depending on what do you want to build? What are the modules that you want to build? You, it's up to you as the, the compiler to resolve those dependencies. If you just go out and get it from the, the repository, if you just uh, yum install asterisk, well, it's going to auto, uh, auto resolve those for you. Also makes it nice to, to, to update. You can do a yum update and uh, update those dependencies, which is very nice. Of course, it's a little bit less flexible. So I showed you guys the menu select tool. Menu select is very nice because it lets you choose which modules you want to compile. With, uh, you know, with, the, with the repository, you're just kind of stuck with a, a generic kind of um, version of it, right? Oftentimes, it's also not the latest version. So uh, the people who build the repository, it's, it's on them to update the repository. And so if you're installing from the repository, the repository may not necessarily be the most up-to-date version. So when you compile from source, you can get the very uh, latest version as soon as it comes out. When you're going from the repository, you're kind of dependent on the repository. But uh, it's usually going to work out pretty good. Of course, I said you can uh, install from a distribution. And so we have uh, you know, several distributions have been used in here. I mentioned them, um, um, you know, Trixbox, PBX in a Flash, Elastix, um, Free PBX Distro. Asterisk now is the, uh, the Digium distro. So that's kind of why I have that one on the slides. And also because my, uh, my buddy Jason Parker is kind of in charge of that. And I think he does a stellar job. Um, and so the idea here is this, is this is closer to the car being built for you. So it's kind of like if there's three tiers. If you know, tier one is I just get the engine. I just get the asterisk toolkit. All right, cool. I've got, I've got an engine, but I've got to do a lot to it to make that a full car, right? The next up, if I would have like the car is, is almost already built, and this would be like getting a distribution like asterisk now or elastics. It's, it's going to be pretty darn close to a, P, uh, uh, you know, a turnkey PBX. It's going to have a, you're, you're going to be able to use Asterisk Now. It's going to have a user-friendly GUI. In fact, Asterisk Now installs with a free PBX GUI. So you can chat with the free PBX. They're, those guys here are at Astrocon. Um, and that's actually like a separate, uh, it's its own open source project. So that's open source project too. Like developers go and contribute to that code. And that's actually the GUI in Asterisk Now. So you've kind of got a GUI interface to Asterisk makes it a nice distro. Um, again, the, uh, the flexibility here is a little bit less. So uh, you know, tier one would be the engine. Then tier two would be like turnkey PBX distribution. Tier three would be like a full on unified communication solution. So some of you guys have built these. Or like a switch box is like the full car. That's kind of your choice. What's the, what's the best way to use Asterisk for you guys? So when you use the GUI, you only have what's been exposed in the GUI. So uh, that's basically it for the uh, installing asterisk. Hop into our introduction into the dial plan.
Yeah, any, any questions on uh, distributions or installing? Let's take a quick ones. You can also uh, text, them, text them in if you guys happen to get service or, or shoot them through Twitter. We'll pop in here, introduction. So uh, let's get into the meat. And um, I'll pop in this module, and maybe we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, we'll do like an introduction to the dial plan, and I'll, sh I'll show you guys some stuff. And maybe we'll be here for the next uh, you know, 45 minutes in, in this uh, module talking about the dial plan. So like I said, I was talking to you guys, uh, some of you guys earlier. And if you're familiar with using the GUI, uh, you know, sometimes it's good to get down into the configuration files to, to see what that's all about. So what we will talk about is first, we'll just kind of understand, we'll go over a little overview, what the dial plan is about. We'll talk specifically about extensions.com syntax. So context, extensions, priorities, and applications, OK? We'll discuss, in particular, the end priority, uh, priority labels, and the same designator. This is all syntax within the dial plan. And uh, just build some basic extensions, OK? So like I said, I, I, tend to, I tend to see a lot of people come to the project. Maybe you come from sysadmin sys background or networking background. And maybe you nece haven't necessarily done actual scripting, like actual coding, right? Now, don't let, that, uh, don't let that be an intimidating factor, because actually, the dial plan is, is very simple to use. And so one of the reasons why Asterisk is so popular is because it has a scripting language. And it is a scripting language. What I'll go through pretty much from now until the end of the day is actually an introduction to programming. And so even if you've never done any programming before, even if you've never written a single script, I guarantee you, by the end of the day, I can show you how to do some really cool stuff in Asterisk, how to call some phones, how to build an IVR, uh, how to you know, send calls to voicemail, how to uh, route calls to a conference room. All of that is very easy within the dial plan scripting language. So it's a very simple language, which means even if you don't come from a computer science background, even if you're new to, to, to programming, this scripting language is simple to pick up, and it's easy to learn. And you can do a lot of powerful things with it right away. It's also a, a decently powerful language. So uh, more and more things have been added into the extensions.conf syntax. Uh, for example, Funk ODBC is, is a recent addition. So you can, uh, well, relatively, I, I guess it's been around for a while, but it's, um, it's working really nice you know, in these later years. Uh, with FunkoDBC, that allows you to create a, a custom SQL query uh, in the FunkoDBC.conf. And so when you want to interface with your, your database, you can even interface with your database right from the dial plan language. So there's a lot of powerful things you can do within dial plan. It's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's kept simple on purpose. So like I said, it's easy to access. But there are some powerful things you can do with it. And we'll walk through that through uh, the rest of today, we'll be, we'll be talking about that. So the asterisk dial plan is, is unlike the dial plan in traditional PBX systems. So perhaps maybe you've seen a traditional legacy PBX, and you had some type of uh, like, a, like a table, like a mapping table. And it would be like extension 100 maps to this specific endpoint. So this, this port on the PBX matches to 100, and this port matches to 101. And it's just like a very simple table. That's like the very old school concept of a dial plan. Dial plan and asterisk is a totally different thing. Like I said, it's, it's literally uh, like it's a scripting language. You're literally doing programming uh, in the asterisk dial plan. And so extensions and asterisk are not a phone. So typically, when we think of an extension, we might say, Oh, this is extension 101, this is extension 102, this is extension 103. That's not the case. An asterisk, an extension, is a script. So think of it like a script that's going to execute. That's what an extension is. Now, that script may dial a phone. So I have a script on my asterisk PBX that if I dial 600, it knows to dial the phone. That's what that script does. But it could do other things. You could have a script that sends a call just to voicemail. 
You could have a script that drops somebody into a conference room. I had a, a really good question earlier. Um, they said, hey, you know, I, uh, I want to be able to send out some call files. I want my CEO to be able to, to call in or, or somebody who's in charge to be able to dial into the PBX. Uh, you know, let's say it's inclement weather. Let's say you know, we've been snowed in or tornadoes are coming, whatever the case may be. Uh, I want to be able to configure it so that I can dial in a number, authenticate to the system, and then choose from a menu, say like, you know, it's a snow day today or, you know, uh, we have a closing for some other reason. And then I want that to execute a call file that will then shoot a phone call out to all of our employees to tell them, hey, don't come into work today, it's a snow day. Simple to do an asterisk. All of that is done with an extension. That would be a script. So you would have a script that you're writing and the, the first part of the script would say, I want to authenticate the person. So you'd have an authentication application. Then you would say, I want to uh, you know, set up a call file. So you would use like the system, the system application to set up your call file on the disk and move it over into the spool directory. All that done is, uh, is done through scripting. And that's through an extension. And so the extension is not an endpoint. The extension is a script. Uh, we can talk about it in terms of logic. If you think of the logic of the system, do I want to do this or this? And as a, as a really as a list of instructions. And the way I like to describe it, and I'll talk about this in my session tomorrow as well, that uh, you know, programming is, is kind of like baking, right? And, uh, and I, I stole this analogy from a uh, you know, professor at MIT. There's some really good programming sources from, uh, from MIT. They've got lots of videos online. And this guy who teaches the MIT uh, Python class talks about programming in terms of baking. And I think it's, a, it's an apt analogy. So the, I, the idea is uh, when I'm baking something, I have a recipe, right? So I might have a box full of recipes, right? And I go into my recipe box and I pull out a recipe. And then I've got a particular recipe that's kind of like a script. And it has instructions on it. And I follow them one at a time, starting at the top and going down. It's exactly how our script is going to run. Uh, you know, sometimes it's going to tell me, like, do this, do this, do this. I'm going to do those things. So maybe put in some flour, put in some eggs, stir it around. Uh, that's kind of like what scripting is. We give it instructions, and it executes them one at a time. The first uh, component of the asterisk dial plan that we want to be familiar with is the concept of a context. Okay? In my analogy here of the uh, you know, baking kind of analogy, if you imagine that box that contains all of your recipes, that's like a context. A context is like a bucket or a box for scripts. Okay? And so one context may contain several extensions or several scripts. So we can see that the uh, syntax here is a square bracket and another square bracket, and then the context name. And I can name it whatever I want. So I can have a context called context name. But it's typically helpful to name your context something, something descriptive. So for example, I like to use the context name internal phones. Excuse me. The, uh, you know, the internal phones context, that's where I would uh, put my scripts to dial the phones that are internal to my enterprise. I might have another context and call it like external phones, where I have phones at the remote site. I might have another context, and I might call that like the features context, where I have extensions and scripts that execute things like, uh, like voicemail or conferencing. I might have an IVR context, where my, where my IVR or auto attendant menu is, right? So you have all of these different buckets. And you can name them whatever you want, give them a descriptive name. Now, the important thing to note is here I've kind of got an abstraction. This uh, picture here is kind of showing like a bucket. Hey, here's a context, and it's full of, it's just a picture. This is not what it actually looks like. But this is the demo context, and this is the default context. Now, you can see in the demo context, I've got a couple extensions, extension 3000, extension 3001. And typically, commonly, extensions are named by a, by a number, because we want to be able to dial them from a phone using D DTMF, right? They don't have to be. I could name the extension Bob or Tom or dial or whatever I want. But in this case, they're, they're numbers. And if you notice, here in the demo context, I've got extension 500. Here in the default context, I also have extension 500. Okay. Contexts, by default, separate extensions. Okay. When you put an extension in one context, it's separate from all the other contexts. When a call enters into a context, it cannot get to any of the other other contexts by default. 
So once you enter a context, there you are. You're in that bucket. You have access to those scripts, and you can't go anywhere else by default. There are some ways to get there I'll talk about. But this is very important because think of security, right? Imagine a context you would call inbound, right? This would be when a call comes in over your trunk, your SIP trunk, or your PRI, and the call comes in, uh, you would have an inbound context. Now, what would you want to have access to in your inbound context? Well, probably like your auto attendant, right? You want callers from the outside to be able to hit your auto attendant uh, or your IVR. You probably also want like a local extensions to be able to ac be accessible from that context. So somebody can call in and dial an extension. What do you do not want in that context? What you don't want in that context is your call logic that allows you to make outbound calls. In particular, outbound toll calls, right? So if you can imagine, if I had all of my logic in one bucket, then anybody who dipped in that bucket, a call could come in over my PRI from random person and go out over a cost toll trunk and cost me lots of money. I want to avoid that, right? The way I avoid that is by putting that logic in two different contexts. I want an inbound context, and I want an outbound context. I want to separate those. They're separate by default, and we have to do something on purpose to get, to get between those. What that allows us to do is that means that I can have the same extension name in multiple contexts. So for example, this script over here, extension 500, that's uh, 500 in the demo context, is going to dial out to Digium, dial to a demonstration server that we have set up, and it's going to play me an audio file. It's going to say something like, congratulations, you've set up asterisk. But uh, 500 over here in the default context could do something totally different. 500 in the default context maybe is the, the voicemail application. So maybe I can call in, or voicemail main, so I can call in and check my voicemail. right? So uh, the, the analogy I like to make here is like the, the fully qualified domain name. So if you guys imagine like you're on your local network, and uh, if I'm on my local network at Digium, I can just type in wiki, right? If I type in wiki, I get to the Digium wiki. We have like an internal wiki we use. But if, uh, if, if I want the fully qualified domain name, I got to do wiki.digium.internal, right? So if you often have a part of the name, but if you want the full address, then you have to type in the full address. That's kind of what we've got here between 500 at demo and 500 at default. 500 is only a part of the address. The full address is that extension at context. Okay? So basically, if you call in an asterisk and you say, give me 500, you know, asterisk is going to say, I don't know what you mean. Unless you're inside of a context already, I don't know what 500 is. You got to tell it, I want 500 at demo or I want 500 at default. We'll see that as we go along. Okay? Uh, earlier I talked about commenting, and here's another kind of visual representation, still abstracted, but getting a little bit closer to what actual dial plan looks like. So remember I said it's line by line, just like a recipe card. And so we start at the top of a file. Imagine this is a file. I've, I've color coded it, but at the top we've got a context. It's called the green context, and it has a couple extensions in it. What Asterisk does is it parses the file, it reaches a section heading, it reaches the, the brackets, and it says, oh, hey, start a bucket. So I'm going to start the bucket. And everything underneath that, I'm going to put in that bucket. I'm going to keep doing that until I reach a declaration to start a new bucket. So it's like, OK, green context, extension, extension, extension. OK, let me start a new bucket. Yellow context, great. I'll put all of these uh, extensions in that bucket. Same thing with the blue bucket. That's how they get in there as it parses down the file. So the physical location of the extension in the file determines what context it's in. Now, of course, this can cause us some trouble because look what happens when I put a semicolon in front of the name yellow context, right? I comment out the, the name of the context. What does that mean? That means this asterisk is going line by line parsing the file. It will not parse that line. It skips over it. It says, oh, that's just a comment. So it just keeps putting everything in the green bucket. You see that? So these extensions all get moved into that green context because I've commented out the context name. As a result, don't co comment out context names, right? If you want to comment out a context, what you can do is comment out the individual extensions. 
and it doesn't, it, it doesn't bother asterisk at all to have extra context around. Or if you'd like, you can comment out everything in the context. That's a good way to do that. So let's talk about extensions. Uh, as I've been saying all along, an extension is basically a script. Uh, to be a little bit more accurate, an ex asterisk extension is the mapping between a dial plan address and a named set of actions. Okay? So I talked about that dial plan address, for example, 500 at demo. That's like a dial plan address. If I go to 500 at demo, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to have a set of actions that I'm going to execute, the name set of actions. So in this case, I would have like extension, extension name, at context, and here would be a context. And I would put my extension here, and then different lines in the uh, extension might do different things. So for example, this one might call out the voicemail, this one might dial a phone, this one might route the call to a different context. Each of those, uh, each step is going to perform an action. And we call those actions applications. Okay? Here's the actual syntax. So I've been abstracting, I've just been putting generically like extension. But here's the actual extension syntax. If you open up your file, you want to declare an extension. This is what it looks like extend equals greater than the name of the extension, comma, the priority. I'll talk about priorities in a moment, comma and then the application. I've got some examples here. Extension uh, 100, or I'm sorry, 1000 here. It's uh, got one priority, so it's just a one line extension. And that is going to use the dial application. So here's the dial application. And this syntax is common to all asterisk applications. right? All asterisk applications have a name for the application and then parentheses. And inside those parentheses, we're going to put some arguments to tell the application what to do. In this case, the arguments are SIP slash Digium phone. Okay? So the dial application expects a certain uh, syntax. So it expects to have a technology and a resource. So the technology could be Dottie, it could be Eeks, it could be any channel driver, it could be local. And then the resource is going to be what resource? So in this case, I've got a SIP peer. It's called Digium Phone. And I'm going to dial that phone. And so you can kind of see, hey, this is easy. I mean, that kind of makes sense. Even if you've never done programming before, even if this is the first time you've ever looked at code in your whole life, you can look at this line. You can say, well, I, could, I could type that line. Extension extend equals greater than extension 1000. I put in priority one, and I, I want to dial a phone, so I use an application called Dial. That kind of makes sense to me, right? Keep in mind that uh, so with one line of dial plan, I'm able to dial a phone. That's it. That's all it takes. A lot of things can be done in dial plan with just one line. Uh, again, here I've got a line called Tom, right? Uh, you can see that Tom also dials a SIP phone. So if I call an asterisk, I say, give me extension 100, and, uh, or I'm sorry, 1,000, and then whatever context these are in, let's say 1,000 at default, that's going to dial the phone. If I say, give me Tom, Tom at default, that's also going to dial the phone. So I can name an extension whatever I want. And in fact, often extensions are named alphanumerically, especially when you just use them internally to the dial plan. So we'll talk about, a little bit more about that later on. Uh, I've got another extension here, 1, 2, 3, 4, that uses an application called NOOP. Okay, no op stands for no operation. It doesn't do anything at all. All it does is it prints something to the CLI. In this case, it's going to say hello world, right? An asterisk priority is going to be a tag that tells the, 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 the step when to execute, right? So you're going to have step one, step two, step three, step four. That's basically what a priority is. Every priority is one step. In the, in the script, and every step is going to have one application. So you can see you use the same syntax, you give an extension a name, you give it a priority, and, a, and then an application, and then you add priorities, and then each priority is going to have a new application, and each step is going to do something different. We'll uh, see what this looks like as we go on, right? I've already talked about applications. An application, uh, in a technical sense, is going to perform an action on or to a channel. Okay? So it's going to perform an action on or to a channel. 
in asterisk, we have uh, applications, and we also have functions. So a function gets or sets data on the channel, and an application performs an action on a channel. Uh, in these days, that distinction is a lot more clear. In days past, sometimes you had an application that set data. It didn't necessarily perform an action. Um, but that's, that's a, a general guideline that applications, they're going to do something to that channel. So that SIP channel comes in. I want to do something to it. I want to bridge it to a phone. I want to I route it to voicemail. That's what those applications are going to do. So let's talk about multi-line extensions, right? So I showed you a one-line extension. Often you have uh, you know, multi-line extensions. So in this case, I've got extension 6000, priority one. We're going to play back Hello World. It's going to be Allison Smith. She's going to say Hello World at uh, priority two. We're going to play back a different file. We're going to say goodbye. And then at priority three, we're going to use the hangup application. And you can just use your imagination at what does the hangup application do. Uh, but in any case, you can see that it's really easy to add extra steps into my dial plan, each one executing a different application. Now, if I'm coding, if you imagine this, right? And I'm coding in a file, and let's say I have a script, and that script has I don't know, let's say 20 lines in it, right? Let's say I've got 20 different applications I want to execute. It's got these 20 lines. Now imagine I need to change step three, right? It would be super annoying to have to renumber all of that stuff, right? As a result, nobody ever writes uh, you know, dial plan app, uh, extensions like this, probably not since asterisk 1.0. Uh, instead, well, actually, I'm trying to think of when actually did we put an extension in, if it was, if it was 1.2 or I can't remember. Since the early days of your. We had n extensions and n priorities? OK. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe even like pre-1.0 version didn't have the n priorities, but that was a pretty early addition. Uh, you could use n priorities. So the idea here, and then the same declaration has been around since 1.6, right? So with the same declaration and with n priorities, We've made this really flexible, OK? The idea here is when I pop in same, same equals greater than, this is really nice because I don't have to keep typing this, the extension over and over again. It makes it uh, easier to script. And with the n priority, n basically says, take whatever the previous priority was and just add one to it, right? So if I uh, go over to my CLI here and uh, some of you guys are probably used to connecting the asterisk with asterisk dash r. And uh, in case you didn't know, you can use the Scooby Doo version. Asterisk. And uh, that kind of works too. Um, so, actually, I don't even want to be here. I want to <laughs> go to uh, Etsy asterisk and open up extensions.conf. Okay? So, here's some uh, dial plan logic. And let's just start out extend equals greater than. And let's call this extension uh, A123. At priority one, let's answer the channel. Then I do the same declaration. And let's play back demo congrats. And then we will hang up the call. OK. So I can save this on the Astra CLI. I will remember I've edited the text-based configuration file now, right? So this is kind of different if you use a GUI. I've edited the text-based file, but asterisk doesn't know that. It does not like ping that file on the fly. You can imagine the latency that that would cause. Instead, it reads in that configuration file when I reload it. So I'm going to issue the uh, dial plan reload command. That's going to now read in that change I just made. Okay. A few other CLI commands. So dial plan reload. That's going to be one of your best friends. You'll use it all the time. Uh, another best friend that if if you were really want to administer asterisk, use all the time, is dial plan show. Okay? If I do dial plan show, it's going to give me my whole dial plan with a bunch of stuff in it. If I do dial plan show and give it a context name, for example, default, uh, show show, it'll show me just that context, right? which you can see it has a, a bunch of hints and some other stuff in there. And I can do specifically dial plan show uh, A123 at default. 
okay? And it shows me just that extension. Now, this is very helpful to me because immediately, if I'm, if I'm troubleshooting, I can see how Asterisk sees my extension. Before I've even made a call, before I've even tried it out, I can see, hey, that works, that works quite well for me. Uh, and in fact, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's say I just made a syntax error. Let's say I just forgot the, uh, the comma there. What, easy enough to do if you're not used to typing a lot of code in. Maybe you forget a little bit of the syntax. You forget the comma, right? So if I save this and then uh, I reload my dial plan, you can see if I do dial plan show a123 at default, I can see right away that something's wrong. I'm supposed to have three priorities, but asterisk only sees two of them. So I know that something is wrong with that third priority. Even from the CLI, as I'm debugging my script, that dial plan show command is going to save me a lot of trouble. So let's go ahead and fix that. Save that up. Reload the dial plan. And I'll just do a channel originate. And uh, what I call that, A123. And I can execute. So what I basically did there with the channel originate is I, uh, I'm using the local channel. And what the local channel does is it, is it treats a dial plan extension just like a SIP channel. So just like a phone calling in, uh, it's, it's created what it calls a local channel. So I've taken extension A123, and I've bridged it to extension A123. So now it's just the audio playing internally. Why is that important? Well, because if I'm scripting, I don't want to keep on making phone calls every time I change my dial plan logic, right? I want to have a, a method to test it inside the dial plan. And so this is helpful to me. I can, I can see the output right here in the dial plan, this uh, what we call the verbose output. And this is how you're going to debug your scripts. This is your best buddy when you are trying to develop dial plan scripting. You can see it tells me, oh, at uh, extension one, it executed answer. And it did that again for these two different channels. You can see that this channel is local A123 at default, dash 757151 uh, semicolon 2, and this one semicolon 1. So there's two channels there, right? Uh, and they have different names. Uh, then they play back, and I can see that the audio is playing. It's playing in GSM format. And then it hangs up. And so I, I can see that all of my logic actually executed. So when you're troubleshooting your Astra system, this is really helpful, the CLI output, the CLI verbose output. In order to get this, I want to set core set verbose to 3 or higher. So if you, uh, if you set it to 0, you can drop that output. And so if I do my uh, channel originate again, I don't get anything, right? I will offer up this warning that you, you probably don't want to leave that verbose logging on all the time, especially if you are logging your verbose messages to disk. So I don't think that they log by default. I think that uh, by default in Asterisk, you're going to log uh, warnings, errors, and notices. But you can enable what they call the full log in logger.conf. And if you enable in logger.conf, full verbose logging. That means everything that pops on the CLI uh, through the verbose logging is going to go into that file. Well, this can fill up your system disk pretty quick, especially if you're, you're doing a lot of calls. So you really don't want to leave that on all the time. But when you uh, want to do some dial plan debugging, especially when you're developing, when you're writing some scripts, this can be a lifesaver. Or when you're troubleshooting, you want to make some phone calls and you want to see what is actually happening. Which extensions did it hit and which did it not? So uh, there's a couple ways to do it. I can say core set verbose 3, and that's a way to turn it on. I've now enabled the verbosity. Or when you connect to the asterisk CLI, you can connect with R V V V, and that extra V V V, the Vs, that's going to set your verbosity there. So now, of course, when I uh, make my phone call, I actually see it executing in real time. And if there's any kind of problems, I can, I can watch what's happening there. It's a very helpful, in addition to like your call detail records and your other you know, SIP packet capture, 
uh, this is very helpful. I know that in Switchbox, even though Switchbox is a GUI-based uh, you know, application, and you really, in Switchbox, you never, you never get on the CLI. Switchbox is all abstracted for you because it's easy to configure. But even in Switchbox, there's a, there's a mechanism where you can say, hey, give me some verbose output from the CLI. And you can tell it, I want like a SIP, uh, a SIP dump or a verbose output. And you can actually get that and download, and it can aid you in your troubleshooting. So that's nice from the CLI. Let's take a look at uh, priority labels. Okay, So uh, in the old days, you would say, if I have all my priorities numbered 1 to 20, and I want to jump to a specific priority. So by default, they're going to execute in order one step at a time. But what if I just want to pop straight to priority 5? Or what if I just want to? pop to a specific priority. Well, then I need, a, I need a way to address it. And that's how we use priority labels. So you would see here, uh, I'm, playing, I'm going to play back Hello World, and then I'm going to play back Goodbye. And at priority three, I'm using the go to application. The go to application does exactly that, whatever address you give it. So in this case, I'm going to priority two. And I can give that any address. So if you'll remember earlier, I said that there are ways that you can get from one context to another. One of those ways is via the go to application. So I'll, I'll show you guys real quick here. Uh, if I have a context here and I had a, uh, you know, let's say I have context sum. Other context named very poorly. And uh, I have an extension here, and we'll call this one, you know, 100 at one playback. You are a dork. All right. So here at extension one, uh, in the next priority here, I can say go to, I can say, uh, now, of course, I, I named this real context real big. Go to some other context name very poorly. Go to uh, priority one, uh, or go to extension 100, and go to priority one. And that's going to route out of this context into this context and execute. And it, it's assuming I have some audio file like you're a dork. Or we could say, you are awesome today in asterisk one, two, three. So anyway, that would be how you can use a go to to go from one context into another context. Uh, in this case, it's, it's just going to another priority. So you can route to another context. You can route to another extension within a context. Or you can just route to another priority. And the idea here is if I actually executed this uh, you know, this dial plan script here, it would play back hello world, it would play back goodbye, and then it would loop back and just keep playing goodbye over and over and over and over again until, uh, you know, until you hang up. This is a nice extension to uh, route your telemarketers to when they call in. Uh, and you can see here, in this case, I've used a priority label. And the syntax for a priority label is parentheses. It's kind of like passing an argument to the priority. And I can call it whatever I want. Again, using a good descriptive name is a good idea for your priority labels. In this case, I've called the priority label loop start. So when I say go to loop start, it goes back to that priority label. So we can jump around within our dial plan. I'm sorry? Priority labels? Um, you know, uh, yes. Yes, they are. So <laughs> that's a really good question, and I had to think about it for a second. And the question was, are priority labels uh, local to the extension? So when we talk about the scope, what scope is that label? Uh, can I use the same label in multiple extensions? And you can, because a dial plan address is uh, context, extension, and priority. right? So I'll show you what I'm talking about. And in fact, maybe I can actually do this in extensions.conf. We will test our theory. So in this case here, I have a uh, priority label, and I will call this test. 
and then I will have extension uh, 111 and and I'll call this one test okay and we'll just hang up here okay then I'm trying to think of how much how much logic I need to put in to, to test this so extend okay so I'm gonna do uh, 100 and 100 is going to go to and we'll go to uh, a 123 comma test and then extension 101 one is going to go to 111 dot test okay so I've got the same priority label and I've used it in two different extensions here it should play back demo congrats and then hang up here it should simply hang up and I should see this executing on the CLI uh, I'm going to do one more extension just for fun I'm going to do extend equals greater than I'll call this null and I'm just going to no op nothing like a live demo to test your so we're gonna do a channel originate and I'll originate local slash null to extension 111 or let's try what do we call it 100 at default let's try this one out okay Let's see, did that work out? Okay, so I've got 100 and I've got 101. Ah, because I've got go to. Let's try this out. Let's try answer. Same. Wait. And wait. Okay. Well, well. Let's try this out. Okay. So. All right, there we go. So in this case, I can see that my uh, channel was answered when I executed this null one, and that bridged it to 100 at default. 100 at default at priority one did a go to, and it went to A123 test. At A123 test, which was priority two, so you can see that it skipped straight to priority two by, via that label, it plays back the demo congrats. And now it's just waiting. I can do a uh, channel request hang up okay now we'll do the same thing but we'll do it to 101 and we can see that that's no problem at all in this case I did a go to this time I went to 111 test right and so it went straight to uh, 111 at default to priority 2 and that's where we called the hang up application so you can see I had that same priority label and it's, it's, local, it's local in scope to the extension. I can use the same priority label in multiple extensions. Now, don't use the same priority label within the same extension. Then you're just going to get some wonky behavior. But you can use the same priority label in multiple extensions. That's a really good question. And that's kind of like the basic rundown of just some real basic syntax and already right now, if you were taking some notes or if you've got asterisk running in a VM or if you're SSH'd into your asterisk box, uh, even if you've never done some dial plan before, I've already showed you how to do some cool stuff. You can uh, dial a phone. You can print something to CLI. We've got a question over here. Exactly, yes. So uh, just like there's a go to command, you can use go to if. And I'll, I'll show that in the, in the session. And there's also an if function. And the, uh, the if function uses like a ternary uh, style operator and gives you two bits of data. And you can return one data based on the, the, you know, how the expression evaluates. Uh, so yeah. That is an excellent question. And the answer is no. So the, let me repeat the question just for the recording. The, the, and then we'll do some follow-up as well. The question is, does all, uh, all dial plan exist in extensions.conf? And the answer is actually no. Extensions.conf is one place to configure dial plan, 
but there's actually several different ways you can configure dial plan. So for example, you can have dial plan in your database. So you can have, and they can both work together. So you could have extensions.conf where you have some uh, logic in the text file, but then you also have your relational database where you have in your SQL database extensions, also other extensions that are perhaps dynamically generated. Those also go into the dial plan. You can also use uh, extensions.ael. AEL stands for the asterisk extension language. And if you're a developer, if you're a programmer, and you're looking at the syntax, and, and um, you know, perhaps I'm going a little slow. I apologize, but trust me, some of the other guys are appreciating the pace. But maybe you're saying, man, this is kind of a cumbersome syntax. It's easy for the beginner, but if I'm already a developer, this is kind of cumbersome. Can I use C style syntax? The answer is yes. If you use the asterisk extensions language, you can use C style syntax. You can use for loops. Uh, I think it even has switch statements. Uh, with with the, the AEL, it allows you to write your dial plan in that C style syntax. And so you can have some of your extensions are coming from asterisk uh, extensions.ael. Some of your extensions are coming from extensions.conf. Some of your extensions are coming from your database. In fact, you can even from the CLI add context, add extensions, and add priorities right from the CLI on the fly. So there's a lot of ways that extensions could get into your dial plan. This is why I said you uh, really want to have the dial plan show command. And that is going to tell you, because that extension there, that may have come from the database, that may have come from AEL. I could have added that on the fly from the CLI. Uh, so the idea is when you do dial plan show, you really know what's in your dial plan. You're seeing asterisk's point of view. When you try to go parse through the text file, that's not, you really want to put it in the text file and then look at it with a dial plan show. That was, that was a really good uh, point. Did you, you had some other follow-up questions? Did you? Okay. Absolutely. So uh, there is there is an operator called a pound include. Okay, and in fact, if you're uh, if you use FreePBX, this is kind of how uh, how FreePBX does dial plan. So you have, or actually, a lot of the files. You have one file, and then it uses a pound include to include other files. This is really helpful for administration. So let's say I don't want to put all of my logic into one text file. What I can do is I can pound include other files. So I might have extensions.conf, that's the main file. But in there, I could pound include, let's say, uh, extensions.ivr, where I have my IVR, and extensions.local, where I have my local phones. And so I have, this is easy, this is for ease of management. I can have multiple files and I can pound include them into asterisk and they get, uh, they get included within the, the context that or so I can have a file just with uh, extensions, they'll get included in the context or I can put my context in that ex external file and import that context as well, which was also a good question. Right, so the, the, question, the question is, is let's say I have extensions all three places. Let's say I have extensions in extensions.ael and extensions.conf and in my database. What's the priority with which Asterisk looks at those extensions? And um, from, from a technical point of view, I'll, I'll actually be honest and say, well, I'm not quite sure. Um, <laughs> but the, the kind of answer there is, it, the way asterisk finds extensions is typically via pattern match. So, um, you know, the, I mean, the, the reality here is let's say you have extension, let's say you have a context default, right? And you have default in AEL and you have default in extensions.conf and you have extension 500 in AEL and you have extensions 500 in, in a default in extensions.conf. 
if I load them both, which one will asterisk pick? And the answer is, don't do that. <laughs> that they're both going into the dial plan. You, you don't want to have the exact same context and the exact same extensions in multiple files. So uh, the reality is, is asterisk can pull from all those locations. You do want to make sure to keep them unique. And the reality is, uh, like I said, OK, it matches via pattern match. So uh, one thing you can do in asterisk is it doesn't have to just be explicitly extension 100. I could say match any extension that's like 1xx, right? And 1xx will match 100, 101, 102, 199, right? Uh, well, if I have 1xx, asterisk will match that. And it'll match that extension wherever it comes from, whether it comes from the CLI or whatever. Let's say I have an, another extension, and it's just xxx. It's any three-digit number. That's going to match 100, 111, 999, 875, right? Any three-digit number. So now I've got a quandary, because I have two different extensions, and they're matched via two different patterns. And in fact, as I'm talking about this, I probably should uh, show you guys what I'm talking about. So um, let's say I do extend, pattern match, 1xx, 1 noop, 1xx uh, pattern, and then extend xxx. One, no op, xxx pattern, which watch out for that xxx pattern that may take you to a website you don't want to go to. So now here's again the beauty of the dial plan show command. So I've got two different pattern matches I've created. One matches any number three digits with one at the front. One matches any number three digits at all, right? Which one will execute? If I dial extension 100, which one will execute? Well, let's find out. I can do dial plan show 100 at default. And does, does anyone want to venture a guess at which extension this, this one will show first? The closest match, which is actually going to be my explicit extension. So uh, check this out, right? So you can see I have an explicit extension. I explicitly defined 100. That's the most specific. That's that one that I made with a go to. And it shows me even the order in which, so if you remember in the dial plan, these are all in different orders. They're all in different places in, in the uh, context there, right? But asterisk orders them according to the one that we'll get to first. So the most specific gets to first. So 100 is the one that's going to execute. Uh, this is the one that would have second would execute second. So if I got rid of extension 100, that would be the next one to pop up. And the last is the least specific. This is really nice logic, because if I've got a lot of pattern matches, and, I, and, and um, this is actually to help you troubleshoot. Let's say you've created some really lots of different crazy pattern matches. And you're saying to yourself, I want to execute this extension, and it's not doing what I thought it would do. Which extension is it actually executing? Do a dial plan show. Dial plan show, extension at context. And it's going to order for you the order of priority. We can see that if I did, for example, extension 102, this matches two extensions. And the most specific one is the one that matches first. And of course, some other random extension, 876, that matches that uh, XXS pattern match. So we have a question right here. OK, excellent question. So the, the question is, if I have multiple pattern matches, so as is the case here with 100, does it execute all three extensions, or does it only execute the top one? And the answer is, it only executes the top one. So asterisk is showing you, for your information and your knowledge, all of, all of the patterns that it will match. Uh, like again, I said, in the case you drop extension 100, you know which is the next one in priority. Uh, or for example, this is really helpful when you're troubleshooting pattern matches. Let's say you have a whole bunch of them, and they're complex. And you have the one that you thought was at the top. This will show you the order to help you get it to the top, right? Or it'll show you which one's usurping it. But when asterisk actually executes that extension, it only executes the one extension, the one that with the most specific match. All right, excellent. Well, what we'll do is um, 
We'll take another short, maybe a 20 minute break, and uh, then we'll hop into uh, some endpoint configuration before lunch. <laughs>